All right, welcome everyone, and thank you for attending the second webinar in the Cooperative Forestry Research Unit's new series. I'm Jenna Zuckert, and I'm the Communications and Research Coordinator for the CFRU. For those of you not familiar with the CFRU, we are a stakeholder-driven research cooperative housed at the University of Maine. We have 34 member organizations, which include forest landowners, wood processors, conservation organizations, and other stakeholders who collectively represent more than 8 million acres of Maine's forests. The CFRU is a core research program in the Center for Research on Sustainable Forests at the University of Maine. This webinar is approved for one Category 1 CFV credit through the Society of American Foresters. If you indicated in your registration that you would like to get credit for this webinar, please fill out the questionnaire that I will be sending you following this webinar as soon as you have the chance. We will take questions at the end of the webinar. At the bottom right of your screen, you should see an online chat box. Please feel free to type your questions for the speakers at any time, but I will read through these questions at the end during our Q&A session with our speakers. Today's webinar is on several new and exciting initiatives that will help us better understand the diversity of birds we have here in Maine and the habitats in which they are found. I'm excited to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Research scientist Lisa Venier from Natural Resources Canada and Adrian Leppold from the Maine Bird Atlas Project. Glenn Mitzelhauser is also on the line from the Maine Bird Atlas Project and will be able to answer questions as well. We'll start now with Lisa's presentation. Lisa is a research scientist for the Great Lakes Forestry Center in Sault Ste. Marie in Ontario. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Lisa. Get your presentation loaded. Um, Lisa, are you here? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, could you share your screen? Sure. There we go. Great. Okay, and feel free to start whenever you're ready. Great. Thanks, Jenna. Um, hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, some work that we've been um, doing at um, uh, that we started at Blackbrook in 2016 um, and we're continuing. We had a, a field season last season as well and we're going to be continuing next season um, working in moving into Maine and uh, another watershed in uh, New Brunswick. I just want to um, uh, acknowledge that uh, there's a lot of people involved in this project and I've had a lot of help with, with the work that we've done so far, including um, lots of folks at JD Irving, uh, Greg Adams, and Carol Michaud, and D David Young, and also um, uh, we have some collaborators at Carleton University, um, Joe Bennett and Shauna Masson, and uh, Scott Wilson at Environment Canada, uh, and then Ken McKilrick, who's uh, a biologist who works for me here at the Canadian Forest Service in Sault Ste. Marie, and uh, Chris Edge, who's a CFS um, uh, research scientist, a new research scientist at Atlantic Forestry, uh, Forestry Center, um, and he's just joining us this year uh, on this project. Um, if I move this down here. So, uh, just generally, the objectives of our project in New Brunswick and now Maine uh, have been to uh, build spatially explicit habitat models for selected important bird species um, using new and existing data and spatial forest inventory and LIDAR data. Um, uh, we're doing additional work beyond just habitat modeling. We're also interested in community analysis, but I'm gonna talk mostly about the habitat model kind of stuff that we've been doing lately. Um, we wanna evaluate LIDAR metrics of understory vegetation structure as p potential explanatory variables of bird distribution. So we've been working on 
um, initially just measuring the understory structure on the ground and comparing that to LIDAR metrics. And then as well, we want to move into actually looking at the um, bird response to those metrics to see if we can um, improve our bird models using this, uh, some of the understory uh, vegetation structure. Um, we also are, are very interested in understanding the, influ the potential influence of landscape level disturbance on habitat availability for bird communities. Um, and that uh, gets into why, we are, why we're expanding the project this year to uh, beyond the borders of Black Brook, and I'll get into that in a little bit. And um, well, the part that I'm really excited about is the, is the potential to take those habitat models and um, basically generate uh, future, um, generate predictions of future bird habitat under alternative management scenarios. And that I see as a, as a really effective way of uh, supporting sort of decision making um, so that we can actually ask what if questions about um, different approaches to management uh, that can um, meet certain uh, sustainability and biodiversity targets. So the way we've been approaching this so far is to um, uh, collect bird occupancy data in a, in a couple of different ways. Um, our primary uh, data collection approach has been with automated uh, field recorders. Um, and we did um, a number of plots in 2016. Uh, we added to that this uh, past year um, point counts to a number of sites where we've also got automated recording. Um, and we're also interested in potentially using uh, automated song recognition with those automated recordings to get at some other um, to get at some other data. Um, so normally what we do is we, we do a, what we call a manual interpretation of the automated recordings. Um, so we listen and record uh, birds that we, that we hear. Um, but the automated recognition is a, is a pretty um, exciting new, new field. Uh, it needs a lot of work yet, but um, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so we're, we're linking the, that bird occupancy data with uh, environmental data using statistical models and we're taking a couple of different approaches to that um, generalized linear models. So we have a, a student and a master's level student at Carleton University who's developing some models for a selection of species using GLMs, but we're also interested in the potential of using um, a, an approach called random forest. Um, which has certain advantages with large data sets um, in that it generally gives you um, better uh, predictive accuracy. Um, it doesn't allow you to summarize bird relationships with environmental data in a, in, with environmental data in a, in a single sort of equation, um, but it, it may reflect better the kinds of interactions that we get between uh, bird occupancy and environmental data. Um, so for that reason, it, I think sometimes it produces some uh, better predictions. We have uh, a lot of different environmental data that we're using within the context of this project. Um, some of it derived from forest inventory, uh, uh, most of it derived from forest inventory, but then as well, we're exploring the LIDAR uh, data, as I mentioned. And the big advantage of the LIDAR data is that in the past, we've known, like we've known for a long time that, that obviously uh, forest structure is really important to bird habitat, but we've never had good spatial estimates of that forest structure uh, in the past. It hasn't been available through, um, um, aerial photography or other uh, other methods of remote sensing like satellite imagery um, but now with LIDAR we're able to uh, generate these spatial estimates and that um, gives us the option to generate habitat suitability maps using that LIDAR data um, uh, as well as um, some landscape metrics and then ultimately where we want to go with this is to generate habitat uh, projections um, over time. So as, uh, I'm sure most of you know, because you're, you're probably coming to this uh, talk and this, these two talks today uh, because of your interest in birds, um, most of our, um, oh, in, in our case, in this particular project, all of our data is collected through auditory bird surveys of one form or another. Um, we do, uh, when we do recorded uh, um, samples, we always use the spectrograms uh, from the recordings as part of our, a tool for doing the manual interpretation. We find that that really improves um, the repeatability and the um, species detection um, when you can actually see the visual uh, signal of the species as well as hearing the, hearing the bird. Uh, one of the reasons for that, I think, is that uh, sometimes when you're listening to the recordings, there may be some faint sounds um, which you 
you don't necessarily pick up, but you see them visually, and then you can hone in on those and, and uh, identify the species. So it gives you, a, a, I think, improved detectability. We've used a number of different uh, recording um, methods uh, over the years. Um, we started with this method that, uh, with this recording unit that's at the bottom here. It's, it's from a company called River Forks in, uh, I think they're from Saskatchewan. Uh, very expensive, very high-end recording. It gives you a, a really a 360 degree um, uh, soundscape uh, of the, of the bird song. Um, the problem with it is that it's not programmable and pretty much you need to be in the field with the recorder. So although it generates a good uh, recording, it doesn't really make it terribly more efficient. In fact, it makes it less efficient to collect the data. It has advantages for other aspects of looking at um, song quality and that sort of thing, um, but not very effective um, for the kind of uh, application that we're looking at here. On the top right, that's the, the SM1. This is, a, this is a company, Wildlife Acoustics. This is their first generation recording unit. Uh, on the left is the, at the top is the SM4, which is the now fourth generation. Um, uh, and so there've been a lot of improvements, much better quality recordings, um, better programmability, um, better, wet, more, more weatherproof, much better durability. Um, so for those reasons, um, or shifting as much as we can uh, to the SM4s, although these units are fairly expensive. They're, they're running in the neighborhood of uh, $800, $900 a piece, so um, it can get pretty pricey if you've got a lot of these units in the field. Um, we uh, initially, the, these recorders have been around for maybe a little over 10 years. Initially, there's a lot of skepticism about uh, using recorded data. Um, birders some, sometimes have a little bit of discomfort with the idea that um, you can collect good data uh, when you're not actually in the field. And um, I think there's, there's definitely uh, some truth to that, although we, we have done some uh, um, comparisons. Um, to understand the quality of the data that we might be getting from the recorded data. So in this figure uh, on the um, y-axis, we have richness. Uh, so there's a number of species that were picked up in a 10 minute recording. On the um, uh, x-axis, we have um, in each uh, panel, we have the first block is the E3A, that's the, the high end recording unit. Uh, in the middle is the field observation and on the right hand side is the SM1. So we were doing these before, that was just when the SM1s had just come out. Um, and so all three of these were done simultaneously on a single 10 minute recording, um, sorry, uh, many 10 minute recordings. Um, and what you can see, uh, and so then each panel represents uh, vi uh, visits through the season. So visit one was, would be early June. By the time we get to visit five, we're into early July. And as you can see, uh, within each panel, um, the field and uh, high uh, um, fidelity recording uh, identifies more species uh, than the SM1 um, and by usually one and a half to two species per uh, per 10 minute count. So they, they are definitely more improved. It's interesting though that the, the field recording, the, sorry, the field observation doesn't actually do much better than the, uh, than the E3 recording, if at all. Um, so high quality recording can substitute. What's more important in this figure though, is that, that the timing of the, um, uh, of the of the sample has more to do with how many species you're going to detect than the than which unit you use, and so by by sampling a lot of a lot in the early season using any kind of recorder, you're going to do better than uh, by sampling late in the season using in the field. So you can sort of compensate for that lower detectability from the uh, SM1s just by pushing your um, sampling more to the beginning of the season. Um, this figure is sort of set up the same way, richness on the y-axis. On the x-axis, you've got uh, one visit versus two visits, uh, three and four visits. So this is 10 minutes versus 20, 30, or 40 minutes. And again, you see the same kind of idea where as you increase the number of samples that you take, um, you do much, you get a much higher richness. And that has much more influence over the, over the number of species you detect than which type of unit you use. And again, um, by uh, using more visits, you can compensate for the lack of, or the, um, uh, the reduced efficiency or reduced effectiveness of the, um, the SM1s. Um, the other thing to note is that it's very easy to take four 
20 minute, or sorry, four 10 minute samples with the SM1, whereas in the field, it requires four, potentially four separate visits to the site. So there's a, there's a fairly large cost associated with increasing your number of visits using field observations that isn't uh, actually present uh, when you use the SM1s. So for those reasons, we're, we have um, for a while now, uh, um, been satisfied that the that the recording units are giving us, um, I think, uh, reasonably good data um, relative to field observations. Uh, we just recently um, published uh, a comparison of uh, using uh, manual uh, detection. So this is um, listening to the recordings and identifying the species versus using an automated recognizer. And these recognizers are built in a, in a software called SongScope uh, that's done by Wildlife Acoustics. And um, uh, as you can see, the manual method is better. Uh, so on the, on the y-axis, we have cumulative detection probability the detection probability goes up very sharply early at, with very few visits on the manual method. It takes a lot more visits on, with the automated recognizer to get similar, but still lower for the most part, um, detection probability. So you're not gonna get a, the, quite the same quality of data with the automated recognizer, but you will get fairly high detection probabilities up upwards of 80% uh, or more um, with using 36, when I say the, the, the um, access label says visits, but these are in fact just additional recordings, uh, which are easy to obtain. So we, we set these recorders out and let them run under a program. And so all of the data is collected at once and doesn't require multiple visits to the site or anything like that. So achieving 36 uh, samples is very simple and easy to do with, um, under with the recordings and then running automated recognizers on 36 samples versus one sample really doesn't uh, isn't that much different. Um, so we get pretty good data with the automated recognizers. The biggest sort of um, downfall of these automated recognizers right now is that they have to be run individually. Um, so for each species, you need to run that recognizer separately on the data. And so where we're finding that trade off is at around 10 species where um, with the manual method, if you're listening, you get the entire bird species community with a certain amount of effort. With the same amount of effort, you can get about 10 species using the automated recognizers. Um, the big advantage of the automated recognizer is for rare species because it allows you to look at or uh, scan um, many, many hours of recorded data um, with very little cost. And so um, what you get is um, uh, a very a very good detection probability for species where you would have to be in the field or you would have to listen to a lot of um, of recorded data if you were using the manual method. So that's sort of that that's the big strength of the automated recognizer. Now I will point out that Wildlife Acoustics has a new program called Kaleidoscope. It's meant to be a multi-species approach. Um, we're we're working with it right now. We're not having a a lot of luck um, getting it to run smoothly. It's certainly not gonna pick up the whole community the way the manual method does. We are getting somewhere between 30 and 35 species on a run. Uh, we haven't fully done the evaluation to know uh, sort of what the quality or detectability is uh, relative to these, the, the new software, but we're pretty excited that I think, you know, within the, within the decade, we're, we're gonna have good um, multi-species recognizers that are gonna really simplify this process. Um, the other big advantage of the automated recognizer is there's a lot of uh, programs out there in the world. Um, I, I work with Pakistan National Park. They don't have a dedicated bird biologist, uh, but we have trained them to use these recognizers so that they can pick up the species that they're most interested in. And they can do that themselves without, re without relying on a, on a, a highly special uh, birder to listen to their recordings and so for them that's a that's a real that's a big win so uh, in Blackbrook we had um, 320 or so um, recorded uh, sites um, in 2016 and in 2017 we have about a just a little over a hundred recorded sites and a hundred point count sites and for the most part those fall in the same location uh, but there's uh, a little bit of variance on that and you can see we've got a very nice spread of points across the whole land base which is what we were going for um, and the other thing that we were interested in is um, uh, looking at a very wide uh, variety of forest types so we uh, with the help of Irving um, we um, stratified the land base into 17 forest types that are listed on the left. 
Um, and then we tried to sample equally in those forest types. Now, obviously, we, we didn't achieve that an equal sampling um, because there, some of these sites are much more common than others. There's also some spatial uh, uh, autocorrelation in the sites. Obviously, the sites that are of similar type tend to be in similar locations on the, on the land base, but um, we tried to spread things out as much as possible. Uh, so we and I see we have 321 sites in 2016 that are divided into those 17 types. The most abundant species in 2016 uh, are here. Um, I don't. I haven't worked up the data to any great extent. The, the master's student at this point is has been running some models, some habitat models. Um, we're having a discussion with uh, her tomorrow about that. Um, so we're, I'm not gonna give you a whole lot of results today. Just wanna sort of give you a rough idea of what we're seeing. So uh, white-throated sparrows, robins, uh, hermit and swains and thrushes and winter wrens are our sort of five most common species in this, uh, in this database so far. So uh, for the first part of the project then, what, when we're looking at building habitat models, we've got Blackbrook, um, so we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of about 420 sites total, um, where uh, uh, about 100 of them have recorded points and uh, point counts as well. So we can do a little comparison there. Our next steps, uh, which we're in the midst of right now, are building those bird occupancy models with, with LIDAR, using uh, generalized linear models and random forest and landscape level variables. Um, and then ultimately, uh, as part of a, an NSERC um, collaborative research agreement um, project, we are we have um, a student who's uh, working on uh, projecting those um, uh, that land base through time under alternative management scenarios, and we're going to piggyback on that work to look at habitat, uh, how that influences habitat for birds. So one of the things that we're really interested in is this idea of landscape level effects and. Um, and uh, and for that, in that context, what we you can think of landscapes in a lot of different at a lot of different scales. What we're thinking about at this point is having looking at what's happening at the local scale at that at uh, that stand or basically territory size scale, and we use about a hundred meter radius. That's about the range of these uh, recording units, and then thinking about how the uh, abundance or presence of species in that. Um, site location is influenced by what's going on in the uh, in uh, areas f uh, further out from that point and so you can think of that in a number of at a number of different scales and it's I don't think anyone's really settled on what really is a landscape for birds um, we'll explore a range of uh, values anywhere from 500 uh, meters radius to uh, two kilometers radius um, in the context of this study. Um, and this one of the reasons why we wanted to do this 2018 data collection is because um, at in Black Brook, the, uh, it's a fairly intensively managed land base and there's a lot of disturbance. So we don't have very much variation in this landscape level disturbance. So we needed to look at land bases where there was a little less disturbance so that we could compare, um, uh, use a gradient of landscape level disturbance um, to look at influence on local scale um, presence of species. So the questions that we have for our 2018 project are how does the intensity of landscape level disturbance influence the forest bird community and individual bird species abundance? Um, and so we'll be putting those uh, values of landscape um, disturbance into our models. We're also thinking about this, um, these additional landscapes in terms of um, uh, as a kind of a reference condition to compare Black Brook to. So um, this is a difficult, uh, uh, at, at truly the landscape scales, at, at the scales of, of forest management, um, at, at the scales of forest management units, um, it's very difficult to have a replicated design for this kind of a question. So really, we're just we want to, to ask a very general question about how does the community in Blackbrook, the bird community in Blackbrook, compare to these communities in these much less intensively managed uh, land bases? Um, and so uh, we'll probably be doing a fair bit, of, a fair bit of community analysis to get at that question. So uh, just for context, uh, so that's 
these are they're all green so that's not, not that helpful but uh, we've got the Blackbrook land base and uh, Quisibus watershed which is right next door to Blackbrook but is much less intensively managed and then the Dabuli site in Maine that we're going to be sampling and Brian Roth at the University of Maine is going to be um, heading the uh, the sampling effort in Michigan we're providing uh, the recorders um, and they're going to place them um, based on um, a set of six uh, forest types that we've stratified by. So we decided we would pare down this design uh, to um, uh, 17 site types is just too many for the for the number of recorders we have in three different land bases. So um, we're, we're just going to go with these uh, six types. So we're going to identify between um, 36 and 40 uh, locations within each of these land bases using these six forest types. So that's about six or seven plots per forest type per region. Um, so it gives us approximately 120 plots with hopefully a strong gradient in landscape level disturb disturbance. Um, and by that, I mean percentage of forest under a given age within a fixed radius around the plot. So those the, that age and that radius are, are yet to be determined, but we'll probably explore uh, different options uh, in our models to see what uh, what makes the most sense. And that's uh, that's all I've got for for what we've planning. Obviously, I don't have a lot of results just yet, but um, uh, I hope that gives you an idea of sort of what we're planning to do and why. Um, and I don't know, Jenna, if you want to deal with questions now or continue. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lisa. I think we'll hold off on questions until the end, and then have questions for both you and Adrian as we go along. Okay. Um, but thank you for sharing. This is incredible technology that you're using and a really interesting study. And I look forward to hearing more about it and hearing what you find in the future. Great. All right. So our next speaker is Adrian Leppold. Um, Adrian is the director of the Maine Bird Atlas Project. And she is a wildlife biologist with the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife here in Maine. And she also serves as our state songbird specialist. Um, just a minute. Um, we also have uh, Glenn Middlehauser on the line, and he is the project manager for the main bird atlas project. So I'll just get Adrian's presentation set up, and we go. Thank you, Adrian. Hey, Beth, thanks for having us, Jenny. Um, so thanks everyone for tuning in. For those of you who were present at the CFRU meeting earlier this month, I apologize that some of this may be repetitive. Um, I tried to change a bit up and go into a little bit more depth about participating with this project, but I wanted to give that uh, up front. So just before we get too far into it, I will just highlight that this is a massive effort that has been a collaborative project among many individuals within the department as well as outside. And so um, the department has contracted with Glenn Middlehauser, Doug Hitchcock, Laura uh, as outreach coordinators um, and have We've been working with Evan Adams as our data analyst person. He's from Biodiversity Research Institute. Um, we've been in the planning stages of this since 2016 with uh, the steering committee members and other subcommittee folks. Um, and so it's just launching this year. So we're really excited to get things underway. Um, in short, it is a five-year effort to document the distribution and relative abundance of all breeding and wintering birds across the entire state of Maine. And to do so, we are partnering our department biologists with other professionals around the state and citizen scientists to achieve this goal. And just to give you a little background of where this is sort of coming from, so. Bird atlases are pretty common approaches to surveying distribution of birds across a given landscape. And back in 1978, 
May had actually conducted its first atlas of breeding birds, um, and that also was a five-year effort to do so. Um, interestingly, oh, I guess I'll just show. So this is just an image of how the state was divided um, back in the first atlas into blocks. And so you can see on this map that, um, is it possible that, I guess, I kind of want to like <laughs> use the mouse as a pointer or something. Um, you can sort of see, you know, especially up in the northern and western mountainous areas. So anywhere where there's no hatching or shading in a in a block here it basically shows that there was no effort um, or no record submitted. So the coverage was certainly sparse in you know certain areas around the state. The state was divided into 706 blocks then and only 243 of them were deemed to have adequate coverage um, for the project goals. So along lines with thinking about state atlases, there's actually an international recommendation that states conduct this kind of survey every 20 years. So 1983 was well more than 20 years ago. So we're uh, we're we're a bit overdue for a present day uh, comprehensive survey of birds across the entire state of Maine. So, with that in mind, again, just our major objective: we're aiming to map the distribution and abundance of breeding and wintering birds across the state. With the first kind of goal being to replicate that first atlas, and in doing so, we can look at changes in species breeding range limits and look at different patterns of diversity and how those might have changed over time. So for example, um, the map here from Massachusetts is showing they completed their second atlas two years ago now, I think. Um, and so this is just an example of one species and how that data contributed to identifying how red-bellied woodpeckers have changed over the landscape. And this is a species that, for those of you that aren't familiar, have been, um, the species has been expanding north in its range, and I would be very surprised to not see something similar in Maine for this species. And so where all these little white triangles are is basically saying, oh, that's an increase of red-bellied woodpeckers from the first atlas in Massachusetts. So replicating that for Maine, and then, the second is to produce baseline abundance estimates for measuring population change over time. And so this is a map of loon populations, for example, and there are certain species groups that have been somewhat adequately surveyed. Um, and, you know, we're, we've been able to make some abundance estimates for over time, but for, for a lot of species groups, this data is completely lacking um, across the state. And so a big goal of this atlas is just to get a comprehensive estimate for measuring future change in population numbers. And then of course, a goal is to just identify priority bird habitats and regions. And so this is an image of a big thrush. And this species in particular is one uh, example that is actually quite dependent now upon forestry practices because their typical habitat, the natural forces just aren't occurring naturally as much anymore. And so with birds being really good indicators of ecosystem health, we can sort of use their presence or absence to understand different forested landscapes and identify forest integrity and sustainability from its presence and use of certain areas. And then lastly, this is this project is really pulling in the citizen science component um, where we're just aiming to try to connect folks with nature at a deeper level. And so to survey the entire state obviously is a massive undertaking and um, the kind of information that it's collecting that we're interested in collecting is asking people to kind of pay a little bit more attention to what's around them than maybe they have in the past. Um, and so, for example, just to go back to showing you some of this area. So this was the first um, 
layout of the survey units for the first atlas, and this is for our present day atlas. And the number of blocks have increased um, because the recommendation now, so the original atlas over here, each of these blocks is essentially a seven and a half minute topo quad. And the present day recommendations for this kind of survey is to make the block or the survey unit a sixth of a topo quad. So you're looking at the entire state of Maine. These orange lines represent the different regional boundaries that we have defined to help organize volunteers and birders around the state. And then each of these other little individual blocks is each survey unit. And so to have full coverage of the entire state, that would ultimately be our goal, but there are 4,080 blocks. Um, and so realistically, you might notice that some of these smaller blocks, some are actually hash marked and outlined in black. Those actually have volunteers already committed to surveying them. But amongst the map, you might also see that we have some priority areas that we're focusing on uh, efforts. So at a minimum, we'd like these little kind of greenish blue shaded blocks one block in each topo quad plus a few extra thrown in, we've identified as priority sampling. Um, but ultimately, I would love to get all 4,080 blocks completely covered. So how do we do that? Well, we need help. And so this project, as many other bird atlases before it, have, is going to capitalize on people's already existing love and interest of birds. Um, and but with that said, I mean, obviously, this image portrays some pretty hardcore bird watchers, I think. Um, but with that said, you know, it's also just folks that feed birds in their backyard or just even pay attention to what's around them. And honestly, it's what we're looking to get from this effort is to recruit people who are outside and pay any attention to birds. So other um, colleagues of ours in the biology field, and certainly many of you as foresters, you spend a lot of time outside. <laughs> and so we're just looking for folks who are outside and paying attention to birds to help contribute to this project. And so the first, the most important part is just going to be figuring out where you are. And so these maps just show a topo versus a satellite aerial image of the same block. And so we've created these block maps for all 4,080 blocks across the state. And these are all downloadable from our website, um, which I'll go into a little bit more in a bit. But just to give you an idea of how, how we go about doing this. So again, we're aiming to collect two basic bits of data, relative abundance and distribution, excuse me, of species across the state. And this is including rare to common birds of all different um, taxonomy, distribution, and habitats. So the relative abundance portion is actually going to be relying on hired technicians. And so we have seven folks that we've hired this year, and they will be joining the team in a few weeks and heading out at the end of May to do point counts along um, roads. And this map is showing the approximate 8,000 point counts that we are going to survey over the next five years um, for information to quantitatively figure out a relative abundance of certain species. Um, and so we, I, I, kind of put roads in quotation marks here because we use the term roads very loosely and <laughs> that we actually hand digitized quite a few of the logging roads in Maine um, with the hopes of being able to include these in the grit sampling scheme that was modeled to produce all of these points. Um, and so, and we can, I think some questions that came up from the CFRU meeting was um, if we would be able to share those routes that we hand digitized. And uh, yeah, that's absolutely possible and not a problem. So we'd be happy to do that. Um, as far as the data collection goes, in addition to the point counts, 
the important part with this project is that we're not excluding species that aren't otherwise easily sampled. So we're also paying special focus to make sure we're sampling secretive marsh birds, high uh, altitude alpine birds, nocturnal individuals and species like um, woodcock and whippoorwills that are active primarily at dawn and dusk. And so those are going to require some more different approaches or protocols. As for the distribution component, that's where um, you all as citizen scientists um, or professional scientists volunteers, I should say, um, would come in. And really what it boils down to is that we are asking people to record date, time, location, and document what species you observed how many individuals of that species were observed, and then document evidence of breeding. And what that means basically is just document what the bird was doing. And then you can categorize that into a breeding code later. So if you just happen to, on your way home tonight, notice a crow flying by with a stick in its mouth. That is a, that's a good breeding record. Um, and so this is, you know, again, this is targeting things that you might notice just in your backyard versus other things that you might encounter professionally in the field. Certainly a bird carrying food is indicative, um, depending on the species of breeding behavior. And doves and crows are here for an example, because these are species that have actively been uh, building nests around this time now. So there's a lot of records already coming in for this project. Um, and these species are a couple examples. If you find yourself in a mall parking lot, for example, I think this picture was taken in the Best Buy parking lot in Bangor. Keep your eye out for killdeer. They often, you know, that they nest in flat open ground areas and parking lots are flat open ground areas. <laughs> so um, this bird is doing a distraction display and that's, characteristic of some kind of breeding activity. They're trying to lure a predator away from something. Do you need to check anything? Um, so this is not an uncommon sight in the springtime. Birds get incredibly aggressive and territorial, and males in particular will attack their own reflection. So even just simple encounters like this, as you go to get into your car in the morning, go to work, can contribute as an atlas record. And then things that you actually may encounter while you're out doing work. You may not think of yourself as a birder necessarily, um, but as biologists and often field biologists, I'm expecting that that's mostly the audience that I'm talking to today is that, um, you know, you're going to encounter things in the field while you're doing work or, you know, this kind of nighttime or dusk, I should say, common display of woodcock is often encountered. Or as you're out doing transects for your forestry lands, you may flush a grouse. Um, or even last July, I think I was out chasing songbirds around and I flushed a whole family of nighthawks um, in the woods. There were young that they nest in open areas, but they move into wooded woodlot or woodlots when the young are still sort of developing and learning how to be nighthawks. Um, and so that's a species that they make a pinking sound, kind of like woodcock do, for those of you who might or might not know, but they have these characteristic white wing marks um, that are visible from both the uh, anterior, or sorry, Oh my God, the top and the bottom, superior, inferior. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, and then for those of you out in remote forests, I don't know if anybody's ever gotten attacked by a goshawk, but this is um, a bird that likes, you know, dense remote forest areas and they're incredibly aggressive. So if you happen to be out and get attacked by a goshawk, that's a really you know, unusual encounter for most people who aren't spending their days in the dense woods of Maine. Um, but that would be a really good breeding record because they are attacking you for a reason. 
And then for those of you who are, who are especially interested in birds and tuned into singing individuals, um, you can even count birds that you hear as you're out in the field as breeding records for species. And I put the little calendar image up there just because this, if you have a singing individual that you're documenting, we just um, ask that you check our handbook and information about safe dates. Um, and so what I mean by safe date is a lot of these birds will sing on migration as well. And so you just need to be careful that you're past the time and we will tell you when that time is of when most migrants would be captured. And so um, I thought I had another set of slides in there, but especially for a lot of, maybe I have it after this part. Um, so some of the overall benefits to foresters and CFRU members for this project, for those of you familiar with the CFRU's Mason project, um, we are, the Bird Atlas is collaborating to share one of our point count technicians for them to work on um, the same properties that the Mason project is trying to survey. And again, a lot of it's just understanding use by breeding and wintering birds for that matter of different forest types can help identify forest integrity and sustainable practices within each landscape. Um, and I guess I got ahead of myself because I just said that. And then um, as Lisa sort of mentioned as part of their goal too, they can improve modeling projections for um, making predictions about where birds may be in the future. And the whole idea with the dollar signs is just that ultimately capitalizing on collecting data for this project will save a lot of money in the future, I think, that may have, you know, would otherwise have to be redirected to support individual species projects, where this is an effort to really comprehensively survey all species across the entire state of Maine. Um, and so if we take advantage of the pool of resources that have already been committed to this effort now, I think that'll ultimately save a lot of money in the future of having to try to answer questions about bird abundance and use of all of these different landscapes. And so a big part of how a lot of um, folks in the forestry industry can help is certainly we're just going to be looking to gain permission to access a lot of these more northern and western forest lands. Obviously, we have access to the North Main woods already, but if you think back again, um, well, and I'll show you again that first distribution of blocks from the first atlas, you can see where, you know, a lot of those gaps are, or where we're going to need to get coverage this year that where we didn't have it in the past. And then the ultimately, you know, we'd love to have folks, whether you consider yourself a birder or not, um, you can either do what we say or we call adopting a block where you would start commit to actually completely surveying an area or just submit incidental field observations from when you're in the field or in your neighborhood. I Just prior to this presentation, our game bird biologist was across the hall and his technician was talking to him about how he found that he just happened to flush a female turkey from her nest. And I said, that's an atlas record. <laughs> Can you, did you enter that in the atlas? And so that I walked them through how you go about doing that. And I just wanted to highlight, again, the value of having a lot of folks within the forest industry aware of the project and interested in um, contributing to it. Because again, looking at this map, you know, this is, there's a lot of gaps in coverage that we'd like to cover for this atlas. And you folks are individuals that are often frequenting areas in remote parts of the state. And so again, it really boils down to, you can record date, time, location, document what species were observed, record the number of individuals, and whatever the bird was doing with um, documenting evidence of breeding. 
And so right now we're just focusing on breeding birds. The wintering component we're aiming to have up and running by for volunteers by winter of 2019. So that's why a lot of this is just sort of breeding season focused right now. And then here I'll just go through a quick rundown of you've made some cool observations. You've flushed a spruce grouse. I should have put spruce grouse instead of rust grouse because that's an even more remote good bird that we like to get records for. Um, you flush a spruce grouse while you're out painting trees for harvesting and you make note of it. What are your options? How do you actually contribute that to the atlas? So the primary way is um, we're using an online data entry system called eBird. For those of you who may not be familiar, eBird is basically an online platform that can be used worldwide to document any bird observation. And it's managed through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology uh, in, from Cornell University. And so there are actually two means or ways of using eBird. And I would say for a lot of you in the field that might just be contributing incidental records, the easiest thing to do is going to be um, to add the eBird app to your smartphone. And the key piece here with adding this app to your smartphone is if you notice this little icon in the bottom right, you want to check and make sure. So again, I just mentioned eBird is used worldwide to document bird observations. So here's how you make it specific that your record is contributing to the main bird atlas. You go to this little wheel icon. And then under the portal selection, make sure you select that you're entering your observation into Made Bird Atlas. This app will just walk you through, ask you a few questions, and 30 seconds later, your, your data is submitted and you've contributed to the project. The other option for eBird is you can just go online on computer. Um, and the easiest way to do that is just to access it through um, the project website, which I'll give you, but the other I'll highlight, again, you just want to make sure because it's used worldwide, there are different entry portals for different data sets. So just make sure that you see this main bird atlas in the upper left hand corner and then you know you're in the right place. And then the third option is if through all that eBird discussion that I just had, if your eyes glazed over, you can feel free to just write down your observations, old school paper and pencil. We have some data sheets that we've provided and you can get them off our website, but you don't have to. Um, that's just sort of a guide. And then we're leaving that option open for folks to mail in data sheets if necessary. Um, and we have a lot of folks in the Amish community that certainly they care and pay a lot of attention to birds, but they're not using the technology associated with it. So that's an option. Um, here's our website to learn more about the project. And um, I just put here a screenshot of our handbook. And then this resources and materials page gives you a lot of um, good information and instructions for downloading and all of our this example data sheet is downloadable on that as well. And so with that, we will listen to this mute song sparrow thing. <laughs> and I guess we'll stop there. Great. All right. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Um, thank you, both of you. These are both really fantastic and very interesting projects, and it's great to hear about both of them. Uh, Lisa, I'm going to unmute you now so that you can answer questions. And Glenn, I'm going to unmute you as well um, so that you can participate in the discussion. Um, so we have um, one question so far. This is from Lee Allen. And I think this is a question for the um, main bird atlas, just asking, are there any locations where there are multiple sampling points in the same stand or landscape? I wondered. That one almost sounds like maybe that's for Lisa. I'm not sure what that's referring to. Okay. The other one is an eBird question and that. Yeah, for Lisa. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry. Could so you, Lisa, sorry, um, could you give that to me again? Mm -hmm. Yep, sorry. Uh, 
So for Lisa, uh, in your study, are there any locations where there are multiple sampling points in the same stand or in the same landscape? Uh, they're going to be definitely in the same landscape. So um, I didn't have a, an image of the, in some cases we have uh, plots that are, they're always at least um, uh, 250 meters apart. Um, so depending on the size of the landscape that we define, there might be multiple points in a single landscape, um, but not in the same stand. Great. Um, and then to answer your question, Lee also asked about um, utilizing eBird data for the Atlas and uh, have people used eBird as a platform for data entry. Um, and you can correct me, Lee, if I'm headed in the wrong direction answering this, but um, yes. Yeah. So basically all eBird data will contribute to this project and we can harvest it. But we specifically contracted with Cornell to develop the Atlas portal. And within the Atlas portal, that's the only place where we have um, locations specified at the block level. And so at a minimum, we really need all sightings to be associated within a block. And so if you just entered a regular eBird record, you wouldn't necessarily see that block boundary of where you are um, and so you don't have to specifically pinpoint exactly where you observed a bird just as long as you're within a block boundary um, of the area where you've made the observation and additionally the the atlas portal that cornell developed for us to use has the ability to summarize the data so that we can track when blocks are reaching completion, either based on how many species have been observed or how many hours, how, what percentage of species have been confirmed breeding versus just possibly seen and observed. And so utilizing the Atlas portal over just utilizing the regular eBird gives us that ability to keep track of the data a little more closely. Um, so we'd encourage people to for Atlas records go into the main bird Atlas portal. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, okay. uh, thank you. Um, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to type them into our chat box here. Um, I have a few questions. I have a question for Lisa. Um, I was wondering, now that you're expanding into Maine, if you have any, just any initial hypotheses for the data that you're going to collect and what you think you might find. Um, yeah, well, I, I, I'm not uh, super familiar with the, with the land base in Maine that, that, uh, that Brian's gonna be sampling on, um, but my understanding is that it's a much less uh, intensively managed landscape than the Black Brook area. Um, and so I, I am anticipating that, that we may see um, uh, a, a difference in communities. I, I'll be surprised if at this scale we actually see a lot of individual species um, patterns um, just because of the power to detect those changes might be quite uh, limited with only uh, six or seven replicates per forest type. But um, the community analysis tends to give you a little bit more power because you're looking at a lot of different species at the same time. Um, so I'm anticipating that we'll, that we'll see some differences there. Um, I, I, I guess um, a reduction in um, the number of edge species, maybe more, may, may, maybe more woodpeckers, uh, but I'm not 100% not sure about that. Okay, right, great. Um, and then I have one quick question for Adrian and Glenn as well. I was wondering how many volunteers you have who have signed up to adopt blocks. Glenn, you might have the more up-to-date version. I, as far as individual volunteers, um, I'm not sure, but my last update, we had 371 of the 4,000 blocks adopted. So oh, wow. I feel like that's uh, a pretty good start for year one of five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that number's up near 400 adopted blocks so far. Um, <laughs> 
and uh, so yeah, it's we don't we don't have a total number of uh, volunteers because some volunteers are going to be submitting records but not adopting a block. Um, so, and some volunteers are also adopting multiple blocks as well. So after the fact, we'll be able to figure out the number of volunteers in a given year. Okay. Great, so thank you. And you said you had 974 as your minimum, right? So you're nearly halfway there too. Oh, yeah, That's to the minimum. Great. The yeah, team. although the, the priority blocks that um, we've assigned for priority surveying, um, they're particular blocks. And so not all of the 400 blocks that are currently adopted are in these priority locations. But, but it's a really good start to get people started atlasing in this first year. Great. All right. Um, well, it's three o'clock, so it's the end of the webinar. Um, thank you all for attending. A special thanks to Adrian and Lisa for presenting and Glenn for being on the line for these questions. Um, if you've requested credit for this webinar, uh, I will be sending you an email with a form to fill out in order to get that credit. Um, so keep your eyes on your inbox for that. And thank you again. We hope that you join us next time.